Well, it's good to see you here this evening. We got uh, several older songs picked out. You may feel like you're at a camp meeting. I don't know. But we want you to sing out with us and uh, sing along every word. Let's start with Bring Them In. Let's stand together and sing. pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. Lord, to thank you for the opportunities of this day. Lord, to smile at people, love on people, uh, share Jesus with people, and Lord, just be the best believer that we can be. Lord, we know that your word promises about itself that it will not return empty. So, Lord, we just pray that the message this morning Lord, that we would see fruits from that, and we'd see folks saved, and we'd see people, Lord's lives changed, and Lord, as we look at the other side of that coin tonight, I pray that God, you would speak to all of our hearts and those who are listening, Lord, by television broadcast this evening. Lord, we come in the powerful name of Jesus, invoking your presence in the service tonight as we worship you uplift your name glorify your name so that men and women boys and girls will be drawn to the saving knowledge of jesus christ lord every one of us has family we pray wherever our families are at tonight that lord you are watching over them and protecting them and lord that you would be using them for your glory and we lift up the hurting families in our congregation and our community, the grieving ones especially, we lift up to you and pray that, God, you would be the God of all comfort in their life. And, Lord, those who are sick and healing, recovering, Lord, I know that their trust is in you. And, Lord, just help them to be back with us very, very soon. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for answering this prayer. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Lord's house. If you're tuning us in by way of television this evening, then uh, we just welcome you and, and pray that God would bless you and touch you uh, through the message and through the worship hymns and the choir special and our musicians tonight. And anything that we can do for you, just let us know. God bless every one of you. We're continuing to pray for uh, the families that we talked about this morning and others that we don't even know about. Maybe you know and I don't, but we're praying for the Laxton family and we're praying for the Davis family and lifting up our sick folks and 
uh, the Birchfields and lifting up uh, Imogene and James and lifting up all of our sick folks. I'm telling you, there's just so many. It, it, can you keep up with all of them? It, it's just amazing, isn't it? Uh, one of my buddies back here shared with me uh, she lost her good friend this week and been friend 60-something years, and, and, but she kn knows the Lord, and people are just hurting everywhere, and we just lift them up. How many of you have got a, a family member or a special circumstance that uh, really needs the prayers of your church? Would you join me in just raising your hand this week? Okay, thank you. Just about every one of us has got something that's burdening our hearts, and we just... Lift all of you up as you lift us up to the Lord this week. May God bless you richly. Uh, let's fellowship with one another before we start our next song and greet one another, welcome one another, and just love on one another a little bit. And uh, if you've not had the time to uh, talk to some of these hurting families, you just grab hold of them and give them a big hug. And I found that helps. Amen? All right, let's do that.
Father, what a joy it is to be back at your house to sing these old hymns of Zion and, Lord, to lift up praises to your name and to remind us that no matter how dark this world gets and how unsettled our circumstances might be, that, Lord, you're on the throne and that you love us so much that you died for us and you bless us with everything that we have. And so now we worship you with our tithes and offerings. And Lord, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, a sacrifice of praise we trust. And Lord, we just pray that as we worship you with the offering tonight, that God, we would honor you with the way the church chooses to use it and that you would multiply it and Lord, send the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Lord, bless the choirs. They come back to sing in just a bit. And Lord, then bless the message, we pray. It's in the powerful and holy and sweet and precious name of Jesus that we give thanks. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> That's what I was saying. <laughs> so what a what a good old man. I appreciate that.
Amen, like that. Thank you, choir. Beautiful job and uh, brought back a lot of memories and helped me look forward a great deal. And so that's always meaningful whenever uh, worship hymns do those two things, whenever we remember uh, why that we can look forward, what Jesus did in our hearts. Uh, this morning we, we learned that the entire human race Everybody in the United States and every other nation, everybody in every state of our 50 states and U.S. territories, everybody in every county in 95 counties of the state of Tennessee, and in every church, every person on the face of this earth is either not condemned or they're already condemned. We learned that. And we already knew that, but we were reminded that that is the situation for entire humanity. Lost or saved. Condemned, not going to be condemned, not condemned, or condemned already. One of those two things. So that's what we learned, and if we're condemned already, we're condemned before God because of our unbelief. Or we are not condemned because that we have believed that trusting belief, not just a mental assent to who Jesus is and was, but that we had a trusting belief, that we put all of our trust on him, that we said, okay, Lord Jesus, I can't do this. I can't save myself. I can't recreate me. I can't clean myself up. But you can. And I'm not only putting my entire life, but I'm putting my entire eternity in your hands. I trust you and what you did for me at Calvary to save me from my own choice of sin that separated me from my Father who loved me so much. I broke his heart. And that's trusting belief. So tonight we want to talk about the fact that even those who have believed in Jesus, even to the saving knowledge of Jesus, who, those who believed correctly about Jesus, that we want to talk about the fact that even those, they're not eternally condemned, the second death will have no power over them, but it's possible for that individual to slowly move away from a close, intimate walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. To just kind of stand afar off, to grow cold and indifferent in that relationship. And when that happens, if we are saved, we need to experience spiritual renewal. And so we don't want just an insurance policy against eternity we want a relationship don't we and only you and only I know where we're at in that relationship with God others may choose to guess or judge but only you and only God know where you're at in that walk when that happens we need to experience spiritual renewal and here here's a bonus for you doesn't cost you anything you don't order that from Lifeway Christian Resources. They can't help you with that. But rather, we need to know that true spiritual renewal comes from God alone on God's terms, not our terms. If we recommit our life to Him, we come on God's terms, not our terms. And that's good news. You know why it's good news? Because we're all guilty of sin and at times as saved people, as not condemned people, we are guilty and in desperate, did you hear me? Desperate need of spiritual renewal revival. So how do you get that? What's the biblical recipe? I should have told people this morning that I was going to be giving them a cooking lesson tonight and maybe more would have came back. If they'd read their bulletin, they might have picked up on that. But I, I actually thought about being, having Debbie get me out her big mixing bowl and maybe bringing the big kitchen aid down here and tossing some stuff in it and, 
And then I happened to think about how mad Paul Young was going to be at me if I did that because, man, I tell you, I'd probably cook like my Mamma Elsie and just have it all over the kitchen. Amen? But uh, I, I threw that away. Maybe we'll do that some night over in the fellowship building or something. Well, what's the recipe? What's the biblical recipe for genuine spiritual renewal? Well, the Bible gave a recipe that King David used. Uh, if you're a bigger sinner than King David, you're a big sinner. King David had a messed up life, didn't he? The Bible said that he was a man after God's own heart, but he was living a messed up life. All because of human desires. All because of not being where he was supposed to be. All because of not bouncing his eyes off a desirable woman. He found himself in a messed up life. And the man of God came to him and told him. You know the story. I'll not go through the Nathan story. But I'm telling you, King David was ready to have a man executed that did the things he did. And Nathan pointed his finger. I can just see him now. Can't you? You remember them old preachers, don't you? They had a way of doing it. I had a pastor once. I, I'll declare his index finger was about a foot long, I believe. And, and it was crooked. And he'd, he'd just point it like that. And it was pointed at me every time. I can just hear, hear David, in, or David when Nathan pointed that big index finger at him. I believe he was one of them big foot long index fingers, guys. And he said, David, you're that man. You're the man I just described. And you know, that's what the gospel does. The good news, see, there's a negative side, a positive side to the gospel, and there's also a negative side to the gospel. And the negative side of it is, is that if we're saved, that we are committed to Jesus. We gave up all rights. We gave up all choices. If we're going to walk in fellowship with him, if we have truly been saved, we are in his army and he is the commander in chief. And we're either in compliance or we're AWOL. We're away without leave. And so tonight you'll have to make a decision about where you're at spiritually. Is your life spiritually messed up like King David's? Well, you and I can experience... Uh, the same kind of spiritual renewal that David did if we follow the recipe carefully that we find in Psalm 51. So I'd like to preach this evening on the subject of the way that those who are not condemned but their life's all messed up and out of sorts, how that we can be spiritually renewed, be of use to God in His kingdom, how that we can see every person as a prospect that needs to hear our testimony, how we come to know Jesus Christ. I want to read that third verse of the 51st Psalm. And if you're physically able to stand, you may stand at this time to honor the reading of the Word of God. And if you're not physically able, you just remain seated, please. David wrote in this 51st Psalm, For I know, I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me he's talking about his conscience his guilty conscience God gave us a conscience and God gave us an understanding of what sin is for I know my transgressions I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight and we thank you for grace. We thank you for your unmerited favor that brought us to the place that the Word of God describes us as not condemned. Saved. You gave us the power, the right to become children of God. Because we believed upon your name. But Lord, you did not take away that free agency, that choice. Even though we fully committed ourselves to you with good intentions of living our life in the army of the Lord, 
Lord, it's sometimes that we have made sinful choices like David, a man after your own heart did. And it may not be for everybody, adultery and murder. It may be something small to them, but large to you. But when they close their eyes or try to get away from it, it by whatever means they try to escape, that guilty conscience. It may just be not reading the Bible, not praying as they need to, having fellowship and communion with you, not witnessing as they should, skipping out on prayer meeting when they could be here, skipping out on Sunday evening when they could be here, skipping out on doing ministry activity when they could be part of it. Oh, Heavenly Father, they're saying right now, my sin. I know about my sin, and my sin is ever before me. Holy Spirit, bring conviction to our hearts. Bring us to an altar of repentance. And Lord, hear our heartbroken, godly sorrow born grief as we plead desperately for your forgiveness and reinstatement to full fellowship in the army of the Lord. We're living in desperate times. We're living in times that people have no hope, Lord. And Lord, we, the very elect of God, could be deceived if it were possible. So Lord, we pray for your help, your forgiveness, your cleansing, your reinstatement, your empowerment, and your commissioning to do the work that you saved us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All people are alike in our natures. We're all sinners. We're either saved by grace through faith or we are still lost in our sins. But either way, we're all sinners. And it's not a matter of pride for us to say we've been saved. It's always been that way. King David is the example we talked about. And he was that man after God's own heart. But the Bible also is crystal clear. It tells us of great sin in his life, even after he was a man after God's own heart. This 51st Psalm contains his confession of that sin. After Nathan confronted him and said, David, thou art the man... This was his heart cry to God that he loved so much, but whose heart he, King David, had broken because of sin. So this is his confession of that sin. And it reveals to us, if you want to look at it that way, I'm just trying to give you a, a hat rack to hang these things on, okay? But five ingredients, five ingredients required for spiritual renewal. What's the first ingredient? Well, if we had that big mixing bowl, that Paul frowned about, uh, we'd put in first that sugar, the sweet sugar of personal faith. Isn't it sweet that we can personally have faith and trust in God's love and His mercy? Look with me at verses 1 and 2 of that 51st Psalm. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Two, I want you to notice a couple of things, and we'll talk about this just a little bit. Notice everything it says about God. Mercy, unfailing love, great compassion. And then when he starts talking about himself, look what he says. My transgressions, my iniquity, my sin. That is the key ingredient to be able to trust God is to know our sin and to know God's compassion and God's mercy. So the first thing we mix up is that sweet sugar of personal faith in God's love and mercy. We must first of all believe that God loves us and that God has love and mercy toward us as sinners, even saved sinners. As after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, after he got his general together and, and uh, she had gotten pregnant, when they found out they were caught, 
he arranged for the death of her husband, hoping to cover up their sin. He put all of his faith, after all of this was revealed by the prophet, he put all of his faith in God's love and mercy. You know, when we sin, we mess up. We hurt ourselves, and we hurt other people. And there's no changing the consequences of that sin. No changing the consequences. It's going to be there. God asked us not to sin, told us, directed us not to sin, because he knew it would be harmful to us. It's not so he could just be our boss. That's not who God is. God loves us so much that he gives us direction. And he knows that sin will destroy us and hurt us and hurt other people. And so he, he, he tried to cover it up, but you know what? He loves us so much. And he is long-suffering. And David addressed those attributes, your unfailing love, no matter what I've done, your great compassion, no matter what I've done, and no matter what you've done or I've done, God has mercy upon us and God forgives us. And so he tried to cover up by arranging for the death of her husband. He put all of his faith after he was confronted by God's man in God's love and mercy. You know, when it comes to sin, they, there's not a single one of us wants God's justice, is there? I said that in a sermon not too long ago. We don't want God's justice. We don't want God's justice. We want his mercy. And you know what? We plead for it. We pray for it. And that's the first ingredient for spiritual renewal, that sweet sugar of personal faith in God's mercy toward us. The second ingredient is that oil. Uh, putting a little bit of oil. You may use canola oil. You may use olive oil. I don't know what kind of oil. You may still use vegetable oil. Hey, you may melt stick butter and pour in. I don't know what you cook with, but there's something you're going to need to moisten up that sugar and then the next ingredient after that. And so you're going to put in the moistening oil of heartfelt confession. Look at verses 3, 4, and 5 in that 51st Psalm. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, God, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And so this heartfelt confession, we must acknowledge our sin to God. Telling your mentor is not enough. Telling your pastor or priest is not enough. He has made us all great high priests before him. If you read the book of Hebrews, it's a wonderful, wonderful epistle about the priesthood of every believer. And he has made it where we can go directly into the holy place and confess. We don't need a scapegoat. Jesus bore our sins on the cross. And so we must acknowledge our sin to God, and the only way to deal with sin is to call it by name and accept the blame. A lot of people want to say, I made a mistake. Boy, I messed up this time, didn't I? Boy, I caused confusion this time, didn't I? Boy, I did. Why don't we just say, I have sinned. I have sinned. So call it sin. Call it by name. Accept the blame. So if we're to experience genuine spiritual renewal, we must stir in that sweet sugar of personal faith in God's love and mercy. Trust Him that when you confess that He's going to accept your confession. And then that moistening oil of heartfelt confession. Heartfelt confession. I've had so many people come on a Sunday morning and every church I've ever pastored, people will get caught in their sin and they'll come on Sunday morning and they'll be blubbering and wiping their nose and, and staining in the carpet with their tears and it seemed to be good whenever their wife or husband or family hugged their neck and everything's fine and they didn't even make it back to Sunday evening service. We're not talking about getting caught and sorry you're caught. We're talking about being sorry for your sin. That you have broken the heart of God. 
and that you are bringing that and laying at the foot of the cross and by faith trusting in that sweet love and mercy of God and a heartfelt confession of your sin. Third ingredient, we must use the flower of prayer. The flower of prayer is the main ingredient for spiritual renewal. You know, I guess I'm not a baker or the son of a baker. Uh, you've got a son of a baker. Amen? And is he a good baker? I know you are. I've, I've had her pound cakes. I could, I could taste that again, you know, anytime you fix one. Just, just let me know. But like I say, I'm not a baker. I can take, uh, I can take into the kitchen with me either my wife or Betty Crocker or I don't know who Duncan Hines is, but I can take them and a couple of eggs and I can fix a pan of brownies if I'm real careful, okay? But, you know, it seems to me that as I remember watching Debbie fix things and remember watching my mother and grandmother make cakes from scratch, it seems to me like the main ingredient was flour. I don't know. It, maybe it just seemed that way to me. But uh, uh, the main ingredient to spiritual renewal is the, the flower of prayer. We must pray from our heart in brokenness. Pray for spiritual renewal. Look at 6 through 11. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me. Here's this cry. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Watch me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, God. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. So the flower of prayer, the power of prayer as the main ingredient for spiritual renewal. We must ask for cleansing, not assume cleansing, not feel entitled to be cleansed just because we're one of his children, but we must ask for cleansing as we realize the depth of our sin and the crushing consequences of our disobedience. David does not merely long for spiritual renewal. He goes to God in prayer, Brother Dale, and he pleads for spiritual renewal. Our desire for, for God should become our prayers. If we are longing for him, I've just before just said, Oh, God, help me, deliver me. Lord, forgive me. And just talk to him like I'm talking to you. So if we are to experience genuine spiritual renewal, we must stir in that sweet sugar, personal faith in God's love and mercy. We must add in and stir up a little bit of that moisturizing oil of heartfelt confession. We must use the flower prayer as the main ingredient for that spiritual renewal. And the fourth ingredient, we must add the rising effect of genuine repentance. I'm assuming we were using all-purpose flour and, and it's not self-rising. So we got to put in a little bit of self-rising, a little bit of, of leaven. And so uh, he says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guiltness, O God, the God who saves me and my tongue. Listen. My tongue will sing of your righteousness, O oh Lord. Open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. I tell you, repentance is more than just simple confession of sin. A lot of people say, why do you talk about repentance when you've already talked about heartfelt confession? Because it's more than just confessing our sin. It's confession, all right, but it goes further than that. It goes to the act of turning away from our sin and turning to a life of being a Christ, a Christ follower. That means something. It means that biblical repentance includes turning to a life of active service for God. You can't just leave something that's wrong and turn away from it and have success at being a Christ follower. You've got to turn to something he's asking you to do. Go back. I tell people you got to trace the line back where you drop God. Where'd you drop the ball? And you've got to go back there and pick up the ball. Now, do we have any golfers here tonight? Anybody golf? Linda golf. You golf. Who else golf? Anybody else golf? All right, here's a golfer. All right, now, if, if you hit the ball out of bounds, 
I used to try to golf a little bit with my son and a, a preacher buddy at different times. And, and uh, man, I got more for my money than anybody did. Amen. So I know about this rule, okay? So don't try to pull one on me. If you, if you hit the ball out of bounds, what do you have to do, Linda? Get another ball, and what do you have to do with that ball? Stroke penalty, okay. So you can drop another ball, take a, a, a stroke penalty, and, of course, most of mine was right there on, on the, uh, when I was trying to drive it, so I didn't have to worry about where the ball went because I never saw it anymore. That's how good I am. But there's a penalty for sure, but you've got to get another ball. You've got to go to something good. You've got to get a good lie. You've got to hit the ball. And, you know, it's, it's a real exciting game if you're having a good day. Amen? And it's a real relaxing not game if you don't know how to play. Amen. So, okay, so to spir experience spiritual, genuine revival, we need to understand, turn your life to active service for God. A forgiven person is a grateful person. And a grateful person is a serving person. And so if we're to experience, we, well, let's, let's boil it down to the end now. We must stir in that sweet sugar, pers what, what is it? Personal trust in God's love and mercy. Pour in that moistening ingredient of personal heartfelt confession. Use the flower prayer as the main ingredient. And then we've got to add the rising effect of genuine repentance. But there's a fifth ingredient. And a lot of people want to leave this one off. Verses 16 and 17. We've got to bake it. We've got to bake these ingredients in the oven of brokenness. The oven of brokenness. Look at verses 16 and 17 with me, please. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. So to simply come to the conclusion that we need to experience spiritual renewal so that we may once again find favor with God doesn't lead to biblical spiritual renewal. This final step of baking the required ingredients teaches us that we must approach God a certain way. We must approach God in a broken-hearted condition about our sins. It's not up here, it's here. That we are broken because of our sins. And we take all of those ingredients. We take the trust, we take confession, we take prayer, we take that re genuine repentance, turning from sin, and we bake it in heart brokenness because the Holy Spirit of God has broken our heart that we have sinned against Him and broken His heart. This final step of baking the required ingredients tells us that this broken hearted condition is a requirement in our approach to God. We must recognize that He is the only, only remedy for our sin that we have chosen to bring into our life as a redeemed sinner, as a not condemned sinner. That we have broken his heart and we must know he is the only remedy for the sin that we have chosen to do in our life. God doesn't want us to try to pay for our sins. God does not delight in sacrifice or offering. King David, if he could have just paid for it, he'd have paid for it. Been done. Very wealthy man. God delights when we're truly broken hearted that we have broken his heart and that we turn from that sinful lifestyle to a lifestyle of servant. And that is that God delights in a broken spirit, a broken heart that is contrite. And it means simply that God is pleased when he sees we are deeply broken because we have sinned. Not for any other reason. We didn't get caught and broken. We sinned, broke the heart of God, therefore we are broken. He paid for our sin on Calvary's cross with the precious blood of Jesus. There's nothing else in this world that can pay for our sin. And perhaps the hymn says it best, and I'll dedicate this to Ashley tonight. What can wash away our sin? Say it with me. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? 
Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Come on, everybody. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, no. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is the recipe that King David used to experience spiritual renewal. David went on and done great things for God. And we can go on and do great things for God. If we want to be successful at experiencing true spiritual renewal, follow the recipe. Trust God's love. Truly confess. Pray, pray, pray. Repent, turn from sin. And then finally, genuine repentance, that rising effect, baking it in the oven of heartbrokenness. Jason Brown, some of you that follow pro football, all the way back now in 2011, he, he was the highest paid center in the NFL. You don't hear a lot about centers, but a very important position on a football team. He played for the St. Louis Rams and in 2011, Jason had two children and he had a mansion with two fully stocked bars of liquor, yet he says he and his wife were dying inside and were likely headed toward divorce. And here's the kicker with Jason Brown. He was a professed Christian. He said that Jesus had saved him from his sin. But he had sinned even after being saved greatly. Jason had to admit that his relationship with Jesus up to that point in time in his life was nothing more than a ticket to forgiveness and little else until, until he released his grip on money and released his grip on football. Jason said that he started releasing his grip on his lavish lifestyle by going convicted by God and pouring thousands of dollars of expensive liquor down the drain. Hallelujah. After leaving the Rams and he turned down offers from three other teams, the Browns put their home up. Jason Brown and his wife put their home up for sale and they bought a 100-year-old farmhouse with a dairy barn and a 1,000 acres of uninterrupted land in North Carolina. Jason would become a farmer and give away what he grows, but he didn't know anything about farming. He says he learned farm basics from YouTube and it resulted in First Fruits Farm an organization that seeks through community and service to boost biblical literacy. He says 10,000 pounds of cucumbers and 100,000 pounds of sweet potatoes later, Jason says this, I know literally still nothing about farming. But he says he can summarize his business plan and his life these days with one word, obedience. we will find the true spiritual renewal when we use God's recipe instead of our own. Our Heavenly Father desires for you and me to experience His grace through true spiritual renewal. And like Jason Brown and his family, we too can turn loose of the things that bind us, that draw us away from God, we can experience true spiritual renewal when our plan for life becomes one word, obedience. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for your love and mercy, your grace. King David was a great man. He was a man you chose. Among Jesse's son, he didn't stand out. 
to no one except you. And through Samuel, you chose him and anointed him as king over Israel. He became a great warrior king and led Israel to great victory. The Lord, he sends. You have chosen us. You have saved us. You've used many in this room tonight in many great ways. The Lord, perhaps some of us have sinned. Maybe it's the small sin that have led us very far away from you. It may not be adultery and murder, but we find ourselves very far from you tonight. The Lord, it requires the same return to trust you, to confess our sins to you, to pray until we pray our way through, Lord, and to repent, to turn away from that prayerless life, thus a powerless life, and turn loose of the things that distract us and turn to you through the brokenness of our hearts. So tonight I just pray that you would invite me and all of these to return to you and trust you as we confess our sins and ask you to use us once again after you've cleansed us to let one word define our lives. Obedience. In Jesus' name we pray and give the glory for the victory tonight. And all of God's people said, Amen. Would you stand with me?